Wow, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Yoshida Hori, I first met in Victoria, the founder of Globus. I had a chance to interview him for the World Entrepreneur Forum. He so impressed me that I said, if I come to Japan, I want to visit his school. Now, you may notice the picture on the screen. That's me. 1975. <laughs> and I was jogging around the Imperial Palace. I was invited to study volleyball in Japan with the volleyball coach of the gold medal team of the 1972 Olympics. That's him on the, on the side there. So I thought I'd put that picture up and, and recognize that 1975 is a long time ago. I look the same. <laughs> no? When we talk about the characteristics of high-level performers, the very first thing to recognize is we all have them. Maybe little glimpses of high-level performance. Maybe tiny little glimpses. The key is to know what those are, catch them, and keep them. We all have them. I want first to say that when I do this presentation, you may have an aha. Let me see if I have it in Japanese. I thought I'd do some of it in Japanese. I won't speak the Japanese. You see, I might say something which may trigger something in your mind that you, oh, that's something I can use. Have any of you ever had an aha? Uh -huh? No, this is yes. Up. Up. Some of you had. Uh, this is also yes. So either way is, is good participation. But you see, if we have an aha, ahas are only as good as the action you take. You have to take action with your ahas. Now, this is the formula for success. Now, you, you might say, what is K times S times A? What does that mean? K is knowledge. S equals skill. And A equals action. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Japan, but I know very often in North America, we're always upping our knowledge score. Take one more course. Read one more book. Attend one more session. But notice that if this formula, you notice I say if it's 8 times, let's take it 8 times 8 times 0 equals what? Let's hear that again. Zero. Zero. Let me hear it one more time. Zero. Okay. But notice if I go 8 times 8 times 1, like I take some action, you see, this is the key. If I take some action on my aha, the whole formula comes alive. What does it look like now? 8 times 8 is 64 times 1 equals? Yeah, it looks like it might equal 64. Maybe. <laughs> That's a trick question. Because if you take one step you'll fall into a second step. Like you start a new venture. You start and you take the one step, you two guys, you started, and you've fallen into a two of action. So the whole formula, just by taking action, 
could be 128. Is that right? Is that right? Help me. Please help me. OK. But the key is taking action. That's the way to get your success. When I decided that I was coming here, I had to take some action. And by the way, I know how the Japanese people keep their mind flexible and, and sharp. Like, I have to play lumosity. I have to keep my brain sharp with brain games. All you need to do here is try to find your way around in the subway. That, that's a special brain game. And at first, I thought it was only me. But then I noticed many of the people that didn't look like me were also lined up at the information desk. So I think that, that that's it. Now, you might wonder why I put this book up. It's called Synchronicity, The Entrepreneurial Edge. Because that's mind mapping. Any of you do mind mapping? Are you aware of mind mapping? Mind mapping is associative thinking. Associative thinking says that our brain goes, oh, there's an idea, there's another idea, there's another idea. That happens to be the founder of, of mind, mind mapping, uh, Tony Buzain. I met him last, well, actually in August in Washington, DC at the World Toastmasters Convention. But here's what Satori says in her book, Synchronicity, The Entrepreneurial Edge. If you have an idea, a, a brilliant thought for a second, as I think that the aha definition in Japanese was a thought that sticks, I like that. That's what my understanding of that in Japanese interpretation. She says you must take five minutes to mind map it. If you get an idea, take five minutes to brainstorm it. You see, you are going to be bombarded with ideas every day in school, everywhere. When do some of you have your ahas? Any of you have them just as you wake up in the morning? This is yes. No, nobody. Anybody in a shower? You have, you have an aha in a shower? Yeah. What about when you're out jogging or walking? Yeah. So that's when your brain is quieted, and all of a sudden, there's an inspiration comes in. But how many of you have had an aha, and then later you go, what was that? <laughs> Did you ever forget it? This is yes? No, you didn't? Yeah, OK. Yeah. So Sertori, in her book, Synchronicity, the Entrepreneurial Edge, says, take five minutes to brainstorm that idea. But here's the kicker. Take some action within 24 hours. And it's amazing what will happen. So I want you to start capturing your ahas. So that's an example of a, a very elaborate mind map. There's one that, that I just did up. If you had an aha, you just go, there's an idea. There's another idea. Whoop. There. You go from one idea, another idea, and, and you can mind map it. Now, you don't need mind mapping software. You can do this pencil and paper. But I, I like to use the mind mapping software. So let's talk about the characteristics of the high-level performers. The first characteristic of high-level performers is they have a mission. How does a person determine their personal mission statement? They ask the question, what do I want to be? What do I want to be? In my case, I want to be known for a person that keeps my word. That's what I want to be. What do I want to do is the second part 
of creating a mission statement. So that's what do I want to be? What do I want to do? And then you mind map it. So if you want to create your own personal mission statement, many people in companies have a company mission statement. Do you have your own personal mission statement? <laughs> that was the right answer. A personal mission statement. One of, one of the parts of my mission statements for my uh, children is I encourage my children to follow their own life path. That's, that, that's what, it, whatever it is, I encourage them to follow their own life path. Is it warm in here? I think it is. My daughter got married. The guy that she married was, uh, I wasn't very impressed with him, but, <laughs> well, he was a dim bulb. You have to think about what a dim bulb is. He didn't have a full deck, but anyway. So my other son phoned me up. He said, Dad, how are you making out on your mission statement now? Did you, I'm not sure if you followed all that. I had to practice my mission statement, which is I encourage my children to follow their own life path. Now, thank God she left him later, but I didn't encourage that. Okay? So get your mission statement. Get a personal mission statement of what you want to be and what you want to do. See, I want to be able to spread the word of high-level performers around the world. I was down in South America about three months ago in Ecuador, and I was doing presentations in Ecuador. I'm going to Iran. I'm going to Zimbabwe. Why not? I'm here. Now, you might wonder, how did I end up here? Uh, my buddy was getting married, so I, I said, uh, Okay, well, I'll come over to your wedding. I wanted, I wanted to observe a miracle because I thought it was a miracle that he was getting married. You're not getting my jokes. <laughs> I said, Mother Teresa, she, she, they, they weren't quite sure they were going to make her a saint yet because she hasn't got enough miracles. But anyway, so I came over to be at that wedding. And then I had to then apply my mind. I go, well, what else could I do? So I just got back from Iwate Prefecture where I visited friends up there and I did a presentation, two presentations up there and now I'm here. This is very exciting to be here. What does it say up there now? Foresight. Let's talk about that. Endpoint visualization and backward shaping is the number one skill if you want to know the number one skill. It's have a picture, have a picture of where you want to be and take everything in that picture and then backward shape that picture. Very important. In 1962, before most of you, <laughs> the Japanese volleyball t men's team toured Europe. They played 22 games, and they had zero <laughs> result, zero and 22. Mr. Matsudara said, the future of Japan volleyball looks very dark. <laughs> unless I have a new vision of what we can do. Now, this is important. He said, we will win the gold medal in 1972 in Munich. That's about 1962 he's saying that. That's foresight. That's the ability to have a vision of what he was going to do. He laid it on the line. He wrote the book. 
winning volleyball before the Olympics. Yeah. Now, when he introduced his new strategies, by the way, you're not maybe all volleyball fans in here, but you just have to think about he introduced things no one had ever used before. And when he took his team to Europe, they laughed at him. They said, what is this? Matsudaira's flying circus? That's pretty disdainful. The Japanese newspaper said, we think Mr. Matsudaira has taken leave of his senses. I said, no, I think what they're saying is they're suggesting you might be crazy. No, he, he read it, read it out. No, he said, no, it says take leave of senses. No, I said, no, Mr. Matsudaira, they think you're crazy. The point is that he had a vision of where he wanted to be, and he backward shaped it by writing the book and carried it out. It's the same thing for yourself. Now, let's take this endpoint vision system. And if you play golf, have you ever seen a golf game? Have you heard of golf? <laughs> Anybody know who Jack Nicklaus is? Jack Nicklaus, you know, some people. Thank you. <laughs> Jack Nicklaus was the most famous golf player before Tiger Woods. And Jack Nicklaus said, when I hit a golf ball, I do this every time. I look down the fairway, and I see where the ball has come to rest, sitting up bright and white. That's endpoint vision. But then he said, the movie fades. And I see where it landed and rolled to there. Then the movie fades, and I see the flight. Then the movie fades, and I see myself hitting it. I'm saying if that's the only thing you understand about my session, it's the most important. But it's not just for golf. <laughs> it's been... The only way I could find my way around the subway. No, second, I'm still fine figuring that out. But always find the opportunity to see the end and backward shape it. I rode my bicycle halfway across North America. Now, you, you wouldn't know North America that well, but halfway is a long way. I had a picture of where I was arriving. And I backward shaped it. Now, as I was riding my bicycle by myself through the mountains, across the prairies, people said, don't go to sleep on me. People, people said, are you doing this for some cure? I had, I had on my shirt, ageless living, the man. Oh, by the way, I was age 70 at the time. I know I don't look that now, but I was age 70. They said, well, you know, some charity, some cure? Well, no. And then I figured it out. I was doing it to bring awareness to the number one disease in North America. It might not be here, but certainly in North America. Bring awareness to the number one disease. Procrastination. Procrastination? Not sure. Some people. Are. That means someday I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it. Tomorrow I'll do it. Someday people put things off. Hey, it's the number one disease in North America. I don't know about here. But that goes back to what I said before. If you have an idea, take action. It's the action that makes the difference. EPV and backward shaping. That's the key. Winning volleyball before the Olympics. There's a picture. Now, what's interesting about that picture, it's the only picture I could get. That was the semifinals against Bulgaria. And they're pretty happy. As you can see they're pretty happy. Well, because they were down two games to zero. <laughs> well, after all, Mr. Matsudera had written the book. 
This was the semifinals. <laughs> they came back and obviously won it three games to two. But uh, I thought that was a great, great picture. Um, he, you have to consider that when you're thinking about endpoint visualization, recognize nothing is impossible. Now, meeting great entrepreneurs, meeting Mr. Matsudara, meeting uh, Yoshida Hori, had prompted us to write the book, Endpoint Vision and Beyond. Because many people, you see, when I worked with athletes, they might have the picture of being in the Olympics. Endpoint vision and beyond. What's beyond that? You see? And so I would, like, for instance, I'm, I'm work, uh, I work with uh, an athlete who was a gold medalist in uh, Beijing, 2008 Olympics. He was the gold medalist for the Canadian rowing team. And there he was. He had got the gold medal. He had no idea what to do now. So I started working with him on his public speaking skills and worked with him. Because that's what I do for a living. I work with business executives across North America. But here was the point. He had the picture of the gold medal. What do we do beyond it? So always think endpoint vision and beyond. See, for instance, back to Mr. Matsudara, his vision was to spread the, the word, the, the volleyball word throughout Japan, and he did a pretty good job of it. Now, when I interviewed Yoshida Hori in Victoria, I said, I noticed that in your blog, you were just down in Kaigoshima releasing baby turtles into the ocean. I could have said, what's with that? But I didn't. Uh, I said, but in the blog, you asked them what happens to the baby turtles. And you said, they said, some survive, and some don't. They have to learn to overcome adversity. So this is when Yoshida Hori said to me, or I explained, he said, for many years, we used to think IQ was the, the uh, how would you say, the measurement of how successful we will be, IQ, intelligence quotient. Then it was EQ, emotional quotient. He said, it's AQ. AQ, adversity quotient. It's your ability to overcome adversity. That's the key. Now, I was mentioning that to one of my clients. And he, the next session we had, he said, oh, Vic, I got the book. What do you mean you got the book? <laughs> he said, it's called Adversity at Work. I didn't even know there was a book. So he picked up the book, Adversity at Work, and I'm, now, here's the kicker. You have three kinds of people. Climbers, campers, and quitters. Wakanimashita Did Was my Japanese OK? <laughs> Do you understand? Do you speak Japanese? Wakanimashita did you understand climbers, campers, and quitters? The question is, do, we, do you understand climbers, campers, and quitters? I think that's, do you understand? Is that what it means? I don't know. Nihongo Skoshi. My Japanese is OK, but the. Climber? Camper and quitter. No, I, that's why I'm checking. You have to give it to me in English. 
I didn't wear my hearing aids today because I didn't think anybody would be talking to me. <laughs> you know, I'm being, you got that. Okay. So in our society, we have people that keep climbing. No matter how many times they fall down, no matter what's happening, they keep climbing. That means that they overcome adversity. See, that's the key. But also in our society, we have many people that are campers in, in, in our workforce. They used to be climbers, but now they're just camping. They just show up and get the paycheck. Domo regato. See? Paycheck. And then there's quitters. They've already quit, but they're pretty subtle. Okay. Where this analogy goes is you have to think about climbers. You see, they want to climb the mountain. The campers just get to the base camp. <laughs> they just get to the base camp. They set up their tent. They set up their maybe their fire. And they get some food, and they just stay there. But the climber comes to the campground and goes, whoa. What else is around? Where can I find some more things to go? My, my son, well, both of my sons, actually all of my sons, but my one son, son is very much a climber. He said, Dad, let's go on a bike ride. OK. Cuba. What kind of much to call Cuba? Cuba. Caribbean. Bay of Pigs. Oh, hey, let's go on a bike ride to Cuba. So we put our bikes on the, on, the, on the plane. We're in Cuba. We're riding around Cuba. You want to know about adversity? Oh, by the way, th there aren't any real bike lanes in Cuba. Lots of bike lanes in Japan. I like the bike lanes in Japan. No bike lanes in Cuba. Then, there are no cars in Cuba, so it's OK. You have to think about that. You have to really think about that. Did you get it? 1958, the Americans quit sending cars to Cuba. <laughs> so very few cars in Cuba. So when we were out on the autopista, I had a whole lane to myself for my bike. But that's an example of are you prepared to overcome adversity? The adversity quotient. Is that the right Japanese here? Can you read that? Is that Japanese OK? It is. This is yes. <clears throat> that's a nice picture. Because the future is in your hands. But it comes from you having a picture of what it is. Now, here's the interesting thing about running movies in your mind. The mind can't tell the difference between a movie and the real thing. Did you know that? That was mind-boggling to me. They did a study. You're university students. You must like studies. You know, a research study. They took these university students and they had them shoot basketball free throws. What kind of must they got? Basketball free throws? Do you know who Steve Nash is? Steve Nash? Do you know Steve Nash? Who is Steve Nash? What did you say? Two times MVP. Wow, you got it. <laughs> How many All Star games? Eight, 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 eight All-Star again. But I coached Steve Nash in volleyball, <laughs> not basketball, <laughs> not basketball, <laughs> in volleyball. <laughs> oh, he was a oh, very good soccer player. His dad is a good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, anyway, but can you imagine? He's from Victoria, British Columbia, and he plays in the NBA, and all these guys are six foot ten. 
and he's about six feet, and he's a white guy, and he's Canadian, and he makes MVP two years. I was just thinking of this. Anybody know who Wilt Chamberlain was? Basketball people? Wilt Chamberlain? Seven foot two basketball player, one of the best basketball players in the world. The reason I'm doing this is I had a chance to interview Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> yeah. At the 76 Olympics. And he wouldn't bend over. <laughs> He's just up there. And so we, we had a good interview. The cameraman is just killing himself because he's going up and he's going down. <laughs> and I was just a young rookie. So the next day, one of the, the producers came up to me and, give me your hand, please. He said, that's it. I'd recognize that hand anywhere. That's the hand that interviewed Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah, it's a good joke. Yeah, very nice joke. Anyway, it's in your hands. Now, I don't know if any of you have read The Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers. Any of you read The Outliers? What's his nationality, Malcolm Gladwell? Who said Canadian? Are you Canadian? You, you knew he was Canadian, though. Not many people know that. No, it's OK. But he took that research from Erickson's material, and it's all around what does it take to be great? Is talent uh, made or is talent born? Talent made or talent born? Talent is made. But it's made with three things. Ignition, that means you get inspired wanting to do something. You two guys are inspired with your job, with your Oh, I can see it. Those beautiful cards that you gave me, I'm inspired. Inspiration. Master coach. The, the reason why I got to thinking about that is right down there it says master coach, you see. I have clients across North America that call me once a week because I still do the coaching even though they're business clients. Master coach, and then here's the kicker. Deep practice. So you see, you can get your master's degree here, but unless you get a coach and unless you have deep practice, do you remember how many hours that they said, Gladwell said in the, it was 10,000 hours. The part that, that Gladwell, I mean, he, he, he talks about it, but he really missed the key. It's 10 hours with the master coach and deep practice. See, I mean, so many people have, have thought about the 10,000 hours. He talks about the Beatles, how they had their 10,000 hours. He talked about uh, uh, Bill Gates, how he had his 10,000 hours. Um, it, but the key is, it's only 10,000 hours if you've got deep practice and a master coach. I'm going to throw out one more thing. It's not on my slides there. I'm just trying to follow my slides. Napoleon Hill said, Show me how a person spends their free time, and I will tell you where they'll be in 10 years. Now, the example in this room is you people have been spending your free time studying a master's degree. So that's obvious. Where will you be in 10 years? But in North America, if people are frivoli frivolously wasting their time, where will they be in 10 years? So I like that quote. Show me how a person spends their free time, and I'll tell you where they'll be in 10 years. One of my, uh, two of my clients, one client's, uh, uh, do you understand, maybe you understand, a criminal? He's not a criminal. He's a criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> he defends murderers. So he's, he's my client. Yeah, we, I help him visualize getting murderers up. You've got to think about that. No, don't think about it. But the point is that he, we do the master coaching. Because here's the key. In Napoleon Hill's book, uh, 17 Principles of Success, 
If you don't have a master coach, then get a partner, a mastermind alliance that you can brainstorm ideas. So having a mastermind alliance is a key. So now, the sheet that you have in front of you, the sheet that you have, that's, that's just the overview of the endpoint visualization system. Turn to the back page. We don't explain much about that, but that back page is, I call it the integrity week. Integrity week, just, just the back page there. Because it says, any of you read Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? You read that? Yes, sir. The poor guy died. He, he fell down some, fell, fell and bumped his head and died. I just thought, sad story. But he talks about, Sorry, got it wrong. This word is urgent. This word is not urgent. This word is important. So even if you even if you knew English, this might be too tough to read anyway. Not Important. Okay. Now, the way you read this is this, this quadrant is quadrant one, and these are activities that are urgent and important. These are activities that are not urgent, but they are important. Okay. I ask the question. Where does a heart attack go? Which quadrant? One. One. Right there. Where does the prevention of a heart attack go? No, oh, you can't answer the second. Somebody else has to. You knew. Come on, where does the prevention of a heart attack, where does it go? It's not a tough question. There's not a right or wrong. Over there in the... Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's a real... It's a, it's a, yeah, it could be. I like to think that being healthy and fit and looking after your heart goes over here. Being healthy and fit. You see, being healthy and fit is important but may not be urgent. But you've got, oh, this is such a powerful concept. I'm glad I decided to cover this today. I may not have covered it. They go, does he know what he's doing? Anyway, but look, if if we if we don't handle, if we don't handle the events here, then they migrate. So where does a divorce go? Come on, everybody, it goes in quadrant. I said everybody. It goes in quadrant. Oh, to see if we can make it. Can we whisper it? Please, I'd like it to go in quadrant one. I'd like it. Well, you're not sure? Okay. All right, can we be a little louder? A divorce goes in quadrant one. Where does relationship building go? Quadrant two. See? If we're not looking after our relationship building, now that's not just... Marriage, it's in business. Looking after your customer relationships is a quadrant two activity. If you don't look after those relationships, they migrate. And so many people in business build their business and forget we have to be looking after relationships. Where does crisis prevention go? Quadrant two, I'll tell you right now, it goes in quadrant two, crisis prevention. Now, you may wonder, 
what that dream week's there for. It's called an integrity week. Because the integrity week says, take the items from here and make appointments with yourself on the calendar. Hey, by the way, if you had an appointment to see your doctor, appointment, doctor, would you show up? No, just nod your head. Don't, don't, don't yell it out. Try to be a little quieter if you can. Okay? <laughs> it's being videotaped, so just... Hey, cameraman, are you watching these guys? They're nodding their heads. You stay on top of it. Hey, what? He says, what? He just woke up. All right. You make, okay, so if you, if you, have, an appoint, if you have an appointment with your uh, faculty advisor, would you show up? This is yes, okay. We've got that down pretty well now. But an appointment with ourself, do we show up? You see? We, if we make an appointment with ourself for something that's important but not urgent, then we have to show up. Give me an example. This, ca this calendar goes Monday to Sunday. Right here at 5 a.m., I do my morning meditation and my morning visualization. Right there. Right here, I have a 6K walk. 6K walk with a beautiful lady. Oh, I, right over here, I have a 4K walk with a different beautiful lady. Well, that's relationship building, okay? I'm single, all right? And I want to be fit. You're not getting it, okay. And right here, I have an appointment with myself for the gym. Right over here, I have the gym. Right over here, I have the the gym. Right here, I have a swim. Right here, I have a swim. Right over here at 6.30 on Sunday morning, I have my bike ride. The point is, these are important to me, but they're not urgent. So I make an appointment with myself and I show up. You get it? And that's the same thing with your Mastermind Alliance. Now, that's what that Dream Week or Integrity Week is all about on the back of your, your page there. Now, what I wanted to go here, go to the part where it says Daily Affirmations. Daily Affirmations. Can you see the part where it says Daily Affirmations? OK. What are affirmations? Uh, have any of you ever used affirmations? Well, actually, everybody put your hands up. You have all used affirmations. It's self-talk. It's self-talk. It's self-programming. If you have a computer, you program your computer. And if your computer's programmed properly, it'll work properly. If you have a brain, you want to program your brain. You program your brain with affirmations. Now, the first part of the 91-day program for people that are on, on my, my, my coaching clients, they mark down their nine positive qualities and the 11 reasons they deserve to be successful. <clears throat> so I want you right now to write down three positive qualities that you possess. You're enthusiastic, you're joyful, you're happy. Oh, those are mine. <laughs> Write down three. Right now, right now. You do it right now. I'm coming around to check. Three affirmations. I am, I am enthusiastic. You look like you're enthusiastic. Mark down enthusiastic. Can you write the word enthusiastic? Wakari enthusiastic? 
No, you don't understand that. It's okay. Um, so what is a positive quality that you have? Think about it. You can put it in Japanese if you want. A positive quality. For example, Mr. Matsudaro was a visionary. Yoshida Hori is a visionary. These, these people are visionaries. Elon Musk, anybody know who Elon Musk is? Would you say he's a visionary? He's going to put people on Mars. If he can get that SpaceX to quit blowing up on him. But he's a visionary. Would Stephen Jobs be a visionary? Oh, he's dead. Well, he was a vision. He was a visionary. So three positive. You yeah, don't have it. No. Three positive qualities. There's the reason. It's okay. Don't don't cross them out. <laughs> oh, you. I see. Okay. Whew. All right. You people came here today because you would like to be great. Nod your head. Okay. okay. Then here's the challenge. You mark down the nine positive qualities and the 11 reasons you deserve to be successful. You send it to me, but here it is. Five minutes, only five minutes, right on your clock, every morning for five minutes, you read that list aloud. Now listen to me, your lips move aloud. Because what that's doing is it's programming your mind. Let me finish the story I started earlier about the visualization and the basketball and I got sidetracked on Steve Nash. They took these basketball people and they had them shoot free throws and then this group practiced 20 minutes a day this group visualized 20 minutes a day, and this group did nothing, okay? At the end of six weeks, they retested them. Listen closely. This group had improved 24% practice. This group had improved 23% only visualizing. This group hadn't improved, sorry. Okay, but... When I read that, I went, whoa, I've got to get this program with my women's volleyball team. I've got to introduce that to all my clients. That, like I was, in fact, I did a Skype call with one of my clients in British Columbia, and I said, Dan, keep picturing that new car dealership. Keep running the movie. I said, by the way, in that movie, I just, you'll like this, I said, in that movie, you've got the opening ceremonies. Can you picture the opening ceremonies? Yeah, I can picture it. Picture that Vic will be there at the opening ceremonies. She's going to fly me in. See? I, I can actually imagine. Yeah, I can, you can see it too. Yeah, see, see, he can already. Uh, you, you better than my buddy. But So I was having him vision and seeing me there, you see. Okay. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. My son who's a friend of Yoshida Hori's, um, we entered the Ironman Triathlon. Do you know what an Ironman Triathlon is? I don't know what the metric, but it's about 2.4 mile swim, 120 mile bike, and I know what the marathon is. It's a full 42K marathon at the end. I had a clear picture of finishing. I had that in my mind. I was going to finish. And I came in and I saw the printout. 16 hours, 16 minutes, and 36 seconds. Wow. That's a long day. You have to think about that. I'm the only guy to get three finishing photos. The photographer said, Vic, if you'll notice, there wasn't anybody else there. You know, like you, were the only, you were the only guy finishing. But the 16 hours, 16 minutes, and 36 seconds, if you finish under 17 hours, you get the T-shirt. So I had the picture of the T-shirt, you see. I use visualization in everything I do. It doesn't have to be out there 
to the end of your career. It could be just small little vignettes. So it's in your hands. Oh, the, in Halverson's book, Succeed, I'll just show you here, Succeed, great book if you're ever looking for one. Um, this was all, this is all part of visualization. They took a group of university students and they were all going home for the Christmas holidays. And they said, would you write out just a one page, before sending email, write out one page on how you spent Christmas Day so we can see how people spend Christmas Day now, how they did years ago. OK? That's fine. So they all agreed. And then one half of them, they said, would you write down where you will be when you write it? What day you will write it? where you'll be. So they say, okay, I'll be on my, my uh, parents' living room. I'll be on the back porch, and I'm going to do it at 5 o'clock. So they wrote that down. You get? Now, notice that that was helping, although she doesn't talk about this, that was helping them get a vision of actually doing it. So when it came time to get the, there it is. There's the result right there. The first group, 32% had it in. The second group, 71% had it in. That's quite amazing. So Halverson said that tiny little bit of intervention made the difference. So she calls that if, then, when. OK, the get better mindset. That's a, that's a good one. The get better mindset. In Carol Dweek's book, the mindset. In our society, we have people that have a get better mindset and a be good mindset. The be good mindset, they protect their be good status. In sports, it's like the natural athlete who just protects their, their status. And they don't venture out and try new things. With my grandson, he writes down, I am getting better at and his hockey, I'm getting better at checking. Then he does a little diagram, and then he visualizes it. So that is right over on that last page. The weekly EPV journal. See that part there? Weekly EPV journal, set a performance goal. Uh, the reason I took you to that was because that's in the mindset program. You want to have a get better mindset. So what do you want to get better at? You write it down. And you write it down, I am getting better at. And then you do a little diagram, and then you visualize it. So I phoned my grandson up, and I said, have you done your journal for the, the game on Friday? Uh, so I maybe phoned him up on Friday. He said, no, I haven't done it yet, Grandpa. And I said, how come? He said, Grandpa, I've got a system. He's 10 years old. You have a system? Yeah. 20 minutes before I go to sleep, I do my journal. So I told my buddy, and he said, any, any of you read The E-Myth? Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth? Entrepreneurial Myth. Very simple statement. The system is the solution. So when I told my buddy, Dr. George McMaster, he said, whoa, your grandson Brody is just ahead of the curve. OK, we talked about the affirmations work, nine positive qualities. Oh, by the way, on the uh, 91 days, five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, I mean, if you want to be great, you can do this. If you don't want to be great, you don't have to. I don't care. But you ready? If you miss a day, you go back to zero. Did you understand that? Nothing worse than to get to 60 days and then miss a day. All right. OK. If you are going to be successful, 
you're going to be a master communicator. You are going to know how to present. In uh, Carmen Gallo's book, this is one of his books, Talk Like Ted. Are you familiar with Ted Talks? Ted Talks? He talks about how to do effective Ted Talks. If you want to do great presentations, then you'll get the book Presentation Zen, who, by the way, was written by uh, Gar Reynolds, who is in Japan, by the way. But that is how to do PowerPoint presentations. And finally, and you notice here, Sundar Pichani is whip smart, one of the smartest technologists on the planet. He is, the guy right there. One of the smartest technologists in the planet. Who might he be working for if he's one of the smartest in the planet? Google. But this tells the story, the simplicity of a slide, which said that in the past, we had 88.6% effectiveness, but our AI is now bringing us up to 93.9. But if you want to be a great and successful business person, you will become an effective communicator. And how do you do that? You make a point and tell a story. Now, I hope that you picked up some stories from me today. How old is my grandson? That's He's 11 now, okay? But he was 10 when I was... <laughs> He's 11 now. What year did Mr. Matsudara win the gold medal? 72. If you want to be great, and you do, your ideas are only as good as your ability to communicate them. But I've got one more slide. Just like Stephen Jobs. One more. Did you, ever, did you ever watch Stephen Jobs? This is what happens to many of us in our businesses. At the inception, the sigmoid curve, we just, it's a little tough. Now we start to grow, we mature, but if we're not careful, we go over the top and we decline. You see, I don't know how many are familiar with the company called Blackberry. Blackberry. Where is BlackBerry now? Right down there somewhere. Yeah, well, no, mainly, but that, that was a Canadian company and was, in fact, Barack Obama just finally turned in his BlackBerry just a month or two ago. But it was the number one smartphone in the world. I'm not, not making this up just because it was Canadian. Okay. But they did not jump in a new sigmoid curve. And this is critical to you, it's critical to me. You see, me doing this presentation today, for me, is jumping my sigmoid curve. I came over for a wedding. Did I have to come and do this? No. But if I want to be on the Get Better program, then I'll do this. I'll test out and see what I can do. I'm very excited about this because this is what you need. You need to be continually jumping the sigmoid curve. Now, here is secret. Well, I'm going to tell you, so it won't be a secret. The mindset that got you to here might not be the same mindset that has to get to here. If you're not continually jumping the curve, you're going to go downhill. I was going to use Microsoft as an example of going down, except their new reprogrammable chip that they've come up with means they've just done a jump the sigmoid curve. I don't know how many of you are even aware of it, but that just came out. Take a look at what Google's doing. Take a look at what Facebook's doing. They're constant. Take a look at what Facebook's doing in terms of their video, in terms of their, oh, the, the stuff they're doing. They were doing fine, 
but they're jumping the sigmoid curve. Now, if your mind isn't ready to jump the sigmoid curve, get somebody in to help you. Now, any of you, maybe, if you ever go to the gym, have you heard of a gym? Gym, wait. Maybe you've seen a gym. Maybe you see, maybe you watched Arnold Schwarzenegger. But here's the point. If I'm doing my weightlifting and I'm now getting stronger and I keep using the same weight, I will no longer get any stronger. I have to jump the sigmoid curve to get stronger. That's why I have to change my program. That's why, by the way, I'm still a member of Toastmasters Public Speaking Organization. Now, I've been a member for over 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Because I want to jump the sigmoid curve. I get back to Victoria on Monday, and I compete on Thursday in the Victoria Speaking Championship. Because I want to jump the sigmoid curve. I want to get better. Can you imagine that? I'm 79 for the love of mine. Some time to slow down. Ladies and gentlemen, I have enjoyed being here with you. I do hope that you got some ahas. I do hope that you'll apply it. And the Endpoint Visualization book is now available online for anybody in this class. You, you, in fact, you have the, the coordinates for it. Yeah, and all it's a matter of doing, all it's a matter of doing is just fill out the, the form and you can download the Endpoint Visualization and Beyond book. We only ask you to, to just put your name down and tell us what you think. Is that okay? I mean, it's, it's kind of kind of a little crass, but, but oh, I wanted to make sure that you got that so you could take this home a little bit further. Good God, I'm glad I remembered that. Calvin? Good being with you here. Q &A. Oh, Q and A. Thank you, Mr. Linda, for the very engaging presentation. So, do you have time for the Q and A? Of course, I had time. What, what else would okay, I be so, doing? You think I'm going out night clubbing or something? So it is now time for There's the Q and A. The guy over there has a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. 1975, I, I was a young man, I could do that. <laughs> okay, so please do not hesitate to raise your hands if you have any questions. Any questions from the floor? Come on, challenge yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's, 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 you got a hand over there. Take a microphone over to her. Wait, wait, there's your microphone. I just want, I just want to clarify. Or maybe you can ex you can ex explain more. Your tip to us: What do we need to do? Five minutes in the morning and five minutes. Okay, in the that's evening? yeah. Okay. Number one, number one, write out your nine positive qualities, because what this is is it's programming your mind. So these are things your mind will accept, because they are your positive qualities. And then 11 reasons you deserve, I deserve to be successful. Could be, by the way, they, they're interchangeable. But I, I made one nine and one 11, so you at least have to come up with another one. Okay. Now you take the list. Are you ready? You take the list, put it right there in your bathroom mirror, set your watch. Read the list down to the bottom, first list, five minutes. Then read it again, and read it again, and read it again, five minutes. And what that's doing is it's reprogramming your mind so that those qualities will shine through even more. And then at night, 11 reasons you deserve to be successful, read the list. It's a good idea, by the way, to do it in a mirror. Look right in the mirror. 
In Claude Bristol's book, The Magic of Believing, he likes to talk about the mirror technique. I don't always tell people about that one, but you can use the mirror. Calvin, you have a question? Anybody? Was there some, you had a question. So have you ever been the, the challenge? Thing? I mean, the other field, except for your the physical field, not variable, not sport, not trial thing. Well, and the, the public speaking. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and with my business clients. With my business clients, and I also I sold I sold life insurance. I sold radio time. Oh, okay. uh, I teach people how to be effective salespeople because, because I've transferred. That's a good question. See, because they go, oh, he's only talking about sports. I've transferred the things I learned into sports into business. All my clients are business clients. They're not athletes. I mean, a criminal defense lawyer? Now, hey, by the way, here's what I do with the criminal defense lawyer. I said, write out your conclusion. Now, you see, that's endpoint vision. So he, he, he starts by writing out his conclusion. Before he does anything, then he does the research. So I'm applying that to a, a lawyer. I apply it to a car salesman. I apply it to a university professor. Uh, one of my clients was a, he's not a client now, but he's a psychiatrist. Another client was a cancer doctor, an oncologist. Another client, oh, by the way, you might look him up. Luke McMaster. He's a singer. Look him up. Write it down. Luke McMaster. Oh, yes. Look him up. He's a great singer. But we applied the principles of the endpoint visualization to his singing career, to his music career, to his writing career. Does that make sense? Okay. But, you see, it's to take these principles and just apply them over here. I, I mean, all my clients, they just automatically use the word EPV. That's an acronym, you know? Like IBM's got an acronym. I got my own acronym. That's a joke, okay? <laughs> Man who laughed last not likely got joke. Confucius say. More questions. Oh, there we go. We're getting, we're on to the question. Another one back over there. <coughs> um, Mr. Lindau, thanks for the wonderful session. Pardon? Thank you for the session. Okay. Um, this is Christine. I'm from Shanghai, and I'm a current student in Globus right now. Shanghai, they've got a Toastmasters club in Shanghai. Uh, I was in one of the Toastmasters clubs. Were you? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question. I'm just curious that you interact a lot with, um, you coach athletes, and at the same time you coach like entrepreneur, business people. What are the similarities, like common, quali uh, like similarities? Okay, similarities between, between coaching athletes and coaching no, business. No, similarities no. between this two group of people. Pardon? Similarities between um, two group of the two group of people. Like, what do you see? They have the common um, oh, okay. qualifications. Okay, so the, the business people that are successful have a clear picture of where they want to go. Athletes who are successful have a clear picture of where they want to go. That's the similarity. Athletes who want to be successful manage their time effectively. Business people who want to be successful manage their time effectively. See, this qu quadrant for many business people is a danger quadrant because they, you take text messages and it, it, it appears urgent but it's not important. And this, this is a black hole. Danger, danger, danger. Because, oh, a text message and you gotta answer it. No. So that, I'm just, like, I don't usually even talk about that quadrant because it's a, but this quadrant, this quadrant, not important, not urgent, that's, that, that's, you know, vegetating. Maybe going to the nightclub. Well, the nightclub might be urgent. <laughs> All right. Did that answer your question, though? Um, not quite, I, eh? I was more wanting to ask about the mindset part. 
the mindset part. Okay, the mindset of a high-performing entrepreneur, the mindset of a high-performing athlete, they're very similar. They have a picture of where they want to be, and they apply their energy every day to that goal, whether it's in business or whether it's in being an athlete. See, the athlete has to get up every day and, and get down and do the training and do the work. The businessman has to get up every day and do the things. The thing is, the businessman generally doesn't know what to do. That's why they have personal coaches, because I help them stay on track on what to do. That's why an athlete has a coach that says, this is what you do. The athlete, very few athletes can go out there and do it all on their own. Very few business people can go out there and do it all on their own. Having a coach or even a mentor or a mastermind alliance is absolutely critical. I'm not trying to get business, but that's, that's essential. I've had some clients for 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. They just keep coming back. They love me. You, I saw somebody else back there with a question. I'll come back there because maybe... Go ahead. Hi, you, you, thank, thank you for the session. I have two quick Questions. One is, uh, uh, you talked about the nine uh, qualities, and you talk to yourself in the mirror for five minutes, right? Um, would that work if you, for example, if I'm a, a good, well, something that I need to work on, and I tell myself, no, um, I would, want, no, I want it to be something you already are. Already are. There's a, there's a difference, and because if it's something, now this is a, this is a great question. That's why I, I I made it this way. Sometimes people want to do an affirmation. I want to be something. The subconscious goes, no, you don't. And the subconscious rebels. So it's better to get the subconscious on board and go, yeah, okay. You are enthusiastic. You are dedicated. You are you know, good at time management. Get the subconscious on board, and pretty soon more of that then shines through. That, that's very important. That's why... When people try affirmations, uh, where they go to affirmations with their not, they tend not to work. You had a second question, though. Yeah, my second question is uh, uh, relating to your um, experience with uh, the volleyball team and well, a lot of, a lot of uh, other businesses as well, because um, we cannot. You just said that we cannot do things on our own. So how does this help? Uh, I mean, with the team. Um, maybe the team chemistry, or how does that, you know, because a team needs cooperation. So if you have all these people um, doing all these endpoint, um, how would, th does that help with the whole team, or is that an, a totally different story? Okay. Um, any of you read uh, Collins's book, From Good to Great? So it's a, good, I figured you'd put your hand up. But one of the things that he says in there, and this is the part I like, is to get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. So if the people aren't on board with what you're doing, get them off the bus. Seriously. With my one client, this was the toughest thing. I just kept saying, you've got, you've got I, I don't call it firing, I call it career pathing. You have to get that. Career pathing. Just explain that he needs a new career. Not here. <laughs> career pathing. So he finally, he finally, uh, about three weeks ago, and I went, oh, it's only taken two years. <laughs> get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus. Now, in terms of getting people on the same page, we, even with my business clients, we do visualization sessions together, the group. Now, when we do a visualization session, we get into a relaxed state. We get into what's called an alpha wave. Your brain waves are in an alpha state. What are your brain waves in right now? Some of you, are, you're not asleep yet. Your brain waves are in the beta state. The alpha state is just that state just before you go to sleep or just when you wake up. 
So I take my clients because to do a visualization, to be effective, it's better to do it in an alpha state. So then we get in a relaxed state. We go down an elevator. I wasn't going to tell you all this. This is all proprietary. Anyway. And we put a big movie screen up on the front of the room. And we sit in our easy chair. And we put our movie on the, on the screen. The movie of what we want. But here's the next most important thing. Then we get right into the movie. And then we have all the sounds, all the sensations, all the smells in the movie. You're right in the movie. And then you run that movie. Back, the, back up the elevator. You're in business. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell you that. but That was a good question, though. We get two hands back over there. I'll come back because I, even though you're on the microphone, I like to, it's not a big room, so I can. Woo, you've got a firm hand, Jay. <laughs> uh, my name is Ji Suk, I'm from Korea. And uh, my question is that uh, you said about the curve and jumping the curve. Uh, so it is very easy to say, but uh, how can we repeat the jumping the curve? Uh, yeah, yeah. How do you how do you keep jumping the curve? Well, it's constantly challenge yourself in different areas. It doesn't, you know, like find an area. You say, there's an area I need to get better in. So jump the curve in that area. Maybe it's marketing. Maybe it's public speaking. Maybe it's relationship building. So find an area that you want to jump and then jump it in that area. See, so you're right. And, and that's why having a mentor is a good idea. Like with some of my female clients, I say, go through the newspaper. Find all the outstanding female entrepreneurs in your city and phone them up and say, would you be my, could I meet you for coffee? Of course they'll meet you. Let me give you one more uh, business. So this is jumping the sigmoid curve. I have... I have a client who has an office right there, OK? It's in a little alley. And there's a street over here, and another one over here, another one over there. And I said, you must do the circle tour. And the circle tour is once a week, you walk that whole circle, 50 meters, 100 meters, 1,000 meters, and you introduce yourself to everybody within 50 meters of your office <laughs> and say, my name is, and he, by the way, he's a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. He's an acupuncturist in Chinese medicine. And so he goes around and he introduces himself. Now, for him, that's jumping the sigmoid curve. But he has to do it at least once a week. And then the curve's a little bigger. And he goes out a little bit further. And it's amazing. When people have their little office, the person next door doesn't even know who they are. Get out and knock on the door and say, my name is so-and-so. This is what I do. So that's jumping the sigmoid curve for him. I also get him to jump the sigmoid curve by going through his list of past clients. And I get him to do it in his mind and see them coming in. We do a lot of really weird stuff. Weird. I do weird things. Yeah, I know you find that surprising. We had somebody else who had their... Okay, let's go back and... Hi, I'm Roby. Oh, good, I can hear you. Yes, you talk a loud voice. <laughs> okay, so my... Actually, this is more of just asking your opinion because you mentioned... What I noticed in your talk is um, looking at the talents or skills that we already have and trying to bring it to the next level or specializing on something. Um, what do you think about people who are more like generalists, uh, maybe jack of all trades, who love learning new things and probably don't really have 
spend their time specializing on something is that does that contradict with high um, high level high performance? level performance you have to be very careful you have to be very careful because because you see the, Have you ever taken a magnifying glass? Magnifying glass? Just, can you understand what I'm saying? A magnifying glass? And there's a hot, sunny day. Beautiful sunshine. And you have some paper there. And if you hold that magnifying glass very still, and the sun goes through the magnifying glass onto the paper, what will happen to the paper? Burn. What happens if you move the magnifying glass? Same thing if you jump here, jump there, and jump there. You won't catch fire. <laughs> if you, if you, you know, if you, yeah, oh yeah, you move the magnifying glass, you don't catch fire. You hold it still and focus, catch fire, put some wood on it, and build a big, beautiful fire. Now you can go somewhere else. You got a nice fire going there. I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that's the answer. You only just jiggle that just a little bit, and there's no fire. Zero fire. Focus. Well, boy, I didn't know I was going to get all these great questions. I really very much appreciate it. Kelvin, you're, you're on. Okay. Oh, we, well, we had that's. All right. Uh, hi, I, I'm Fan. I'm also from the full-time MBA. Uh, just to add on to the question, okay, you talked about the fire and the focus and jumping around. So when do you define the fire? That's the question. Whatever, whatever you, you don't have to wait. Whatever you've decided, just get focused on something and do it. Find out where you can go. Get, because if you're looking here and looking there, You'll never find it. I understand. Then, after that, you talked about the, um, the curve, right? So you have to jump on to something else. No, jump further up. Further up. In the company. You, you refine something that you're doing and get better at something you're doing within the company. Like, I didn't say for BlackBerry to have totally gone off somewhere else, but just found a way to have moved their company forward. I mean, even take a look at Nokia down the tube. Uh, Samsung, if they have another fire, will be down the tube, too. <laughs> They're burning up airplanes now. <laughs> That's what just happened. You're not allowed to smoke on the airplanes. The, the, yeah, you're not allowed to smoke on the airplane. The, the, the Galaxy 7 was smoking. Anyway, you, you need to find a new way to improve and get better. That's why I continue to do my public speaking, so I continue to improve and get better. That's why I did this presentation today, so I could get better. I'm not sure I quite answered your question. I, I know what you're saying. You, there isn't a magic answer to, to it, but you won't find out unless you can hold that thing still enough to get a fire going. If you hold it still enough to get a fire going, Okay, get the fire going, it goes somewhere else. But if you haven't got the fire going, I'm not, I'm not letting you off the hook. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, there, there's one more question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in your presentation, you said uh, there are three types, three types of people, camper, uh, climber, climbers, climber, campers, and quitters. Quitters. And uh, do you think what the important key point to change camper to climber? Okay, well, that's a tough one because generally speaking, campers are former climbers. <laughs> See, so, so they've already slipped back to the campground. To get them to go from camping to climbing is difficult. But people say, how do you motivate somebody? Give a person what they want, and they'll give you what you want. 
So you have to find out what it is would excite them, what it is that they're interested in, and then work with them on that. But the problem you're faced with, with campers, is they've come back down the hill and they're saying, fine, I'm just, I'm just going to camp out here until I get to 65 and retire. Quitters, they've already, they retired a long time ago. They're still there, but they're already retired. Okay, we got timeout signal. Time out? Hey, you get the prize for knowing Steve Nash. Two, M, <laughs> two MVPs. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Linda, for answering so many questions from our audience. Let us give another big round of applause for Mr. Linda.